Hello, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to this Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News webinar. It's entitled, Reducing Downstream Harvest Steps for Improved Bioprocess e Economics. To paraphrase that late, great comedian, Rodney Dangerfield, biomanufacturing sometimes doesn't get any respect, or at least the attention it deserves. When discussing biotech, many people zero in on the novelty of drug discovery or the uncertain adventure of a potential product winding its way through the ups and downs of the research and development process. But consider the fact that downstream processing, or bioseparations, can be responsible for up to 60% of the total biomanufacturing cost. Further, if you think about the degree to which an inefficient and uneconomical downstream process operation could negatively impact the cost of the final biopharmaceutical product, you realize how important biomanufacturing is to new product development and commercialization. Looking more closely at the issue of cost, a number of factors affect the economics of a bioprocess. Two significant ones are equipment design and the type of operation being carried out. Today's webinar will focus on a new approach to improving bioprocess economics. Our discussion will cover a second generation expanded bed adsorption system that has been designed to eliminate separate clarification steps from mammalian cell culture and microbial fermentation broths. The removal of a number of biomanufacturing steps leads to less handling and shorter process times. The result, a more economical and more efficient bioprocess. To help us learn more about methods for improving biomanufacturing economics, we've assembled an expert panel. Let's meet them. Alan Lehm serves as the Technical Director for Upfront Chromatography. Alan will provide a detailed description of the robust second-generation expanded bed adsorption system. Dr. Asif Ladawala, Senior Engineer 3 in Bioprocess Development at Biogenetic, will discuss the economic benefits of the direct capture of monoclonal antibodies in bioprocess operations. Richard Wright, Principal Research Scientist at Pfizer, will explore the use of MAB-direct protein A for the capture of antibodies from Cho cultures. And Ralph Dawenga, who serves as Vice President of Global R&D at DSM Biologics, will describe direct product capture with the robust expanded bed absorption system. I'm John Sterling, Editor-in-Chief of GEN, and I'm going to serve as moderator. Please feel free to enlarge the slide images or download the complete presentation. At any time during the webinar, you can send a question in for our panelists. Type your question into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console, and then hit Submit. The panel will try to answer as many as possible during the question and answer segment that takes place after all the presentations have been made. So if everybody's ready, let's get going. Alan Lean will now begin his presentation. Alan, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, John. Dear colleagues in downstream processing, I'm excited to get the opportunity to tell you about Robust, which is a trademark for second generation expanded bed absorption. First slide, please. As you may know, expanded bed absorption was first introduced in the early 90s. Since often chromatography invented the technology, we have introduced very significant improvements and expanded bed absorption is today an industrially proven technology applied in the isolation and purification of proteins in the scale of thousands of kilos per day. About one year ago, the commercial rights to the pharmaceutical applications of the technology were acquired by DSM Biologics, and today we cooperate closely with DSM to further develop the biotechnological applications while off-run chromatography on its own is focusing on industrial applications outside the pharmaceutical area. Next, please. During the next few slides, I'll describe the major new features of the robust second-generation EBA. But first, a few introductory remarks as to why this technology is such an exciting new unit operation. This slide shows you the very basic difference between a classical packed bed absorption column and an expanded bed column. Unlike the packed bed columns, expanded bed columns does not comprise distribution plates or pistons that confine the bed within a given space. The absorbent bed is allowed to expand by the upward flow, 
and the degree of expansion is dependent on the flow rate as well as the viscosity of the medium flowing through the column. This dynamic system allows the free passage of cells and other particulate impurities, and there's no back pressure building up inside the column. During absorption, the crude feedstock will pass, and uh, when getting to the eluate, you have a combined effect of clarification, concentration, and capture of your product into one step. Next slide, please. Thus, this minimization of steps in the capture uh, is also a route for improved process economics. The minimized steps improve yields in itself, and you do not have to invest in several layers of capital equipment. There will be less material costs, and there will be considerable time savings during the capture. Less labor and overhead costs and optimal facility utilization and flexibility is built in the robust expanded bed absorption. Next slide, please. This slide shows you half of the expanded bed absorption, the beat itself, how it is designed, and how we obtain the high density of the beat. If you follow the red arrow, you will see a drawing of a beat, and you will see that the beat is comprised of an agarose phase, which is the continuous phase where proteins diffuse, and a tungsten carbide phase, which are discrete small particles of tungsten carbide. About 10% by volume of tungsten carbide is incorporated into the agarose bead. Now, tungsten carbide is a completely inert material. It has a density of about 15, 16 kilos per liter, and it makes the, the sorbent bead very heavy. Due to the amount of tungsten carbide inside the bead, about 10 volume percent, the final bead density will be about 3 grams per milliliter. This bead will be cross-linked with standard chemical methods and it will be derivatized with ligand chemistry and it will be stable to sanitation in one molar sodium hydroxide even at 50-60 degrees Celsius. If you follow the blue arrow, you will see how the beads inside the column creates a self-generation particle size gradient. So the flow is provoking a size gradient of particles where the smaller particles will find their way to the top of the column and the larger particles will be found at the bottom of the column. So this self-generating size gradient means that you do not have to worry about packing an EBA column and there's no repacking either. It is doing it all itself when you put on the flow to the column. This self-generating particle size gradient is also a stab stabilizing factor for the expanded bed as such. It stabilizes against convection and back mixing. And the very high density and high mass of the absorbent increases this stabilization. And it brings the bed back, quickly back, to a steady state if the bed as such is disturbed, for example, by air bubbles that pass the system, air bubbles that does not as such mean anything harmful to the system as such. Next slide, please. The very high bead density of about three grams per milliliter has a lot of interesting effects on the bed. I already mentioned that the high mass of the bed is increasing the stability of the bed. And that's because a high mass of the bed as a system gives a high degree of system inertia. And that gives robustness to the whole system. You can put a lot of energy into it without having big fluctuations in the expanded bed or turbulence and so on. The very high bead density also allow you to run the process at high flow rates, even with very small beads. And the use of very small beads, again, gives you excellent mass transfer and high productivity for your protein. 
again the very high bead density, allowed it to run an expanded bed column at a minimal uh, degree of expansion, such as, for example, two times. And that, again, means that you will decrease the buffer consumption during the uh, washing and dilution procedures. Next slide, please. This slide shows you some pictures from our pilot unit where you can see uh, a very crude feedstock to the very left. You see a white plant extract uh, passing a black absorbent bed. And you see how sharp the interface is between the bed as such and the headspace uh, liquid on top of that. You see the same phenomenon to the right where we are in the lucian phase this plant extract contains a brown protein, which is eluted, and you see, again you see how sharp the interface is at the top of the bed. And this very sharp interface minimizes the top mixing and gives you minimum buffer consumption during the process. Next slide, please. The EPA columns themselves are also designed for maximal performance with very crude feedstocks. So again, unlike the first generation expanded bed absorption columns, these columns do not comprise anything that could clog up during the process or give you a hard time when trying to clean the system. The distribution device in the bottom of an expanded second generation column is uh, designed as what we call a reverse garden sprinkler. So it is a rotating fluid device where the fluid is flushed into the column through small holes which are pushing liquid downwards. And wh while the thing is rotating at the same time, you get a very efficient uh, distribution of the liquid, which is necessary, but you also have a system which does not clog up due to very small pores, so there will be no clogging. So therefore, you will have a very robust performance of the system, and you will have a system which is very efficiently cleaned and can take high temperature cleaning with one mole of sodium hydroxide. So this is a robust and very scalable column concept. Next slide, please. So on this slide, you see a picture of one of the pilot units having this uh, rotating distribution device. Next slide, please. So this is an overview of, of the overall features and benefits of the second generation absorption. So crude feedstock processing, no back pressure from a sorbent bed. That means, again, that you have no flow rate limitations related to back pressure. You have no bed height limitations related to back pressure, and therefore the columns do not need to be designed as pressure vessels, and you can do with low pressure pumps. The robust columns accommodate air bubbles and precipitated material, which means that you have a separation technology with very little downtime and no repacking issues. The dynamic system means that you have no dead spots and therefore easy to clean hardware, which facilitates clean in place of the absorbent. And as mentioned, you can do hot sodium chloride cleaning. Next slide, please. Thus, the expanded bed absorption lends itself for an optimal capture technology for pharmaceutical biomolecules from a broad range of raw materials, such as mammalian cell cultures, microbial fermentation broth, transgenic milk, transgenic plant extracts, and animal tissue extracts. Next slide, please. And expanded bed absorbents combine well with all the classical ligand chemistries that you will know from packed bed absorption, which of course includes ion exchange ligands, mixed mode ligands, methyl chelate ligands, and affinity ligands, such as protein A. Next slide, please. This last slide shows you an industrial installation which is purifying immunoglobulins from cheese whey at a very large scale. 
So this unit is a one and a half meter diameter column. It contains 800 liters of a solvent and is running 15,000 liters of whey per hour, producing hundreds of kilos of immunoglobulins per day. Thank you very much, and back to you, John. Alan, thank you so much for that detailed presentation on the robust system. One of your key points, optimal capture technology, is going to be an ongoing theme of today's webinar. If you are just now joining our webinar, welcome. As I previously mentioned, we'll be conducting a live Q&A segment following the panelists' presentations. Again, please type your question for any or all of our panelists into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. Our second panelist, Dr. Asif Ladiwala, will now begin his presentation on the direct capture of monoclonal antibodies. Asif, you can go. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you to the organizers of this webinar for providing me with the opportunity to present my work here. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the work we've done at Biogenidec uh, towards looking at the direct capture of monoclonal antibodies using EBA, or expanded bed absorption chromatography. Uh, specifically evaluating the product from Upfront Biosciences, uh, which is the MAP Direct Protein A Absorbent and the robust system for the EBA platform. Um, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors on the stock, um, Julie Chung, John Parachi, and York Thomas from the TD group at Biogenetic, uh, Rob Noll, Inga West, and Alan Lime from uh, Upfront Chromatography. Next slide, please. So to begin with, uh, I'd like to walk the audience through the potential advantages of EBA, which are widely known and publicized out there. Um, to begin with, uh, there's also the improved process throughput and yield that EBA talks about. Uh, and this is mainly accomplished as a capture chromatography step by combining the harvest and capture steps into a single unit operation, thereby achieving clarification, product concentration, and partial purification in one step. Um, EBA also touts about better host cell impurity clearance, and that's expected to mainly be achieved due to lower shear forces relative to conventional harvest operations such as microfiltration, defiltration, or centrifugation. Um, this essentially reduces the possibility of cell disruption, leading to reduced host cell impurities. Um, and finally, EBA also has the potential to reduce processing costs, which is mainly by the combination of uh, two unit operations into one. And any increased buffer requirements um, as a result of EBA operation are often offset by the combination of um, two more downstream processing steps. So EBA is not really a new technology. With that, moving into the next slide, I'd like to highlight the differences between uh, what we're calling the first generation EBA and the new upfront platform referred to as the second generation EBA. Um, the major advantages here are that the second generation EBA boasts of higher density adsorbents, uh, which provides us the opportunity to operate at higher flow rates, um, therefore resulting in higher throughput. Uh, and that's the fast line family of adsorbents from upfront. In addition to that, um, Upfront also boasts about an improved column system design, which essentially has an enhanced flow distribution system resulting from a rotating oscillating flow distributor, as well as the elimination of screens and frit plates in the design, which were found to be uh, severely plugging or fouling in the former first generation EBA platform. Um, so if you look at the next slide, that kind of gives you an idea of some of the issues that we faced at Biogenidec when working with the streamlined family of columns uh, which employ a frit plate design. So if you look at the figure on the top left corner, you see the frit plate as it is before a run is performed on the column. After basic cleaning, the figure on the right gives you a, a clear picture of the extent of fouling of the frit plate from the cells and cell debris in the feedstock. Um, and even after urea CIP as well as detergent CIP and reverse flow, you can see that the frit plate is still fairly foul and cleaning was not successful. So next slide, please. So with that, let me walk you through the objectives of this project within Biogenetic. Essentially, these involved evaluation of the improved second generation EB adsorbents and systems, really a proof of concept study, to see if some of the issues of the first generation EBA were really overcome by these design modifications. Um, and also evaluate the adsorbent for high throughput processing. In this context, we looked at using protein A EBA 
as an alternative to centrifugation and protein A capture steps for a representative monoclonal antibody process. Let's call that IgGA for the purpose of this presentation. Uh, in this context, we compare the product quality and process performance to that of the conventional centrifugation and protein A capture process, and also demonstrated process scalability. Next slide, please. So with that, uh, let me walk you briefly through the experimental strategy that we employed uh, as part of this work, which essentially, as you can see from the slide, uh, use a combination of EBA experiments as well as packed bed experiments to achieve the objectives. So we started with characterizing the new MAP-direct adsorbent in terms of evaluating the flow expansion characteristics of this adsorbent in the EBA mode. Uh, moving on to the process development, we evaluated the dynamic binding capacity as a function of resonance time, and then both as a function of resonance time and cell density in the EBA mode. Subsequently, we also did some preliminary process uh, optimization in the EBA mode as well as the pack bed mode uh, to quickly lock down the operating conditions for the remaining process steps of this column operation. We then moved on to performing a process verification where we performed confirmatory EBA runs on a lab scale EBA column and compared the results against map select controls. Um, and for the final piece, we looked at the assessment of the scalability of the EBA system going from lab scale to pilot scale uh, and again, comparing the results against the map select controls. Next slide, please. So getting the results of our work, uh, the, first, the first slide, slide seven, talks about the characterization of the adsorbent itself, uh, where we looked at the flow expansion characteristics of the adsorbent using different feed streams, or different uh, solutions that mimic different feed streams that you would typically encounter in a protein A column operation. So for example, we use DI water to mimic aqueous buffers, CCF for the cell-containing material, and a four molar urea, which mimics a uh, standard regeneration solution that we might employ for regenerating protein A It's open. As you can see from this plot on the slide, uh, because for all three solutions employed in the study essentially overlapped, and that's a great thing because that tells us that the bed expansion was relatively insensitive to the fluid viscosity. Also, in the literature, it's widely publicized that in order to achieve stable fluidization, we would like to operate between a 2 to 3x expansion factor for this bed, which translates into an operating flow velocity of 3 to 500 centimeters per hour for this particular map-directed map solvent. Next slide, please. We then went on to perform some of the process development on this adsorbent, where we initially looked at dynamic binding capacity uh, as a function of resonance time in the pack bed mode. Uh, this experiment essentially employed harvested cell culture fluid without cells to measure the dynamic binding capacity as a function of resonance time and compare the results to that of the traditional map select adsorbent. As you can see from the results in this slide, we looked at two different versions of the map direct adsorbents, a high capacity lot as well as a low capacity lot. And essentially, both lots of the map direct adsorbent had capacities comparable to or greater than that of the map select control. Next slide, please. We then went to measure the dynamic binding capacity of this map direct adsorbent in the fluidized mode and the expanded bed mode, where we would expect the capacity to be both a function of resonance time and perhaps even a function of the cell density. So the first set of experiments in the expanded bed mode looked at capacity as a function of resonance time, where we took the high capacity adsorbent lot and subjected it to load material at what we're calling normal cell density conditions. So that's about 10 million cells per mil for this particular product, IgGA. In that context, we looked at resonance times between 6 to 12 minutes, and as you can see, from the plot, the blue trace in the plot, uh, there wasn't a significant impact of resonance time on the capacity once we were above a six minute resonance time, which corresponds to uh, the three to 500 centimeter per hour operating range for a typical 20 centimeter bed height or higher. We also then went on to look at capacity as a function of cell density, where we created two pools at a low cell density of about four million cells per mil and high cell density of about 20 million cells per mil and evaluate the capacity again at the same resonance time for the low capacity lot of the map directed open. As you can see from the plot again, the capacities were largely comparable, varying only within the limits of experimental error. So that tells us that the capacity is essentially independent of cell densities for this particular product within the range of cell densities examined. Next slide, please. 
we had all of that data, we moved on to perform some process verification runs where we sought to compare EBA performance, both in terms of product quality as well as yields, against MAP Select Control. Essentially, for these runs, we employed identical buffers for both the EBA and MAP Select Control runs, with the exception that we used about a 25% excess buffer volume for EBA versus backbed runs. So as you can see from the table on this slide, we looked at two different CCF lots, uh, roughly at about the same cell densities, between 8 to 10 million cells per mil. We also looked at two different resin lots to evaluate process consistency, as well as get an idea of the robustness of the EBA process compared to the MAP Select process. Um, as you can see, for, again, from the table moving on to its right, the yields for both the EBA and the MAP Select steps were fairly comparable, all above 90%. The product quality in terms of aggregate DNA and host cell protein levels was also very comparable for both the MAP Select and as well as the EBA aluate pools. The only difference that we noticed was in the protein A leachate levels, which were slightly higher for the EBA adsorbin versus the MAP Select control. Next slide, please. Once we successfully had verified the process at small scale, we moved on to perform a scalability assessment but the goal was to scale this up from the lab scale, a 2-centimeter diameter column, to the pilot scale, a 10-centimeter diameter column, uh, which represents a 25x scale-up factor. Next slide, please. So those experiments were again performed with two different lots of CCS, uh, with cell densities around 10 million cells per mil, again, as a as way of evaluating process robustness for different cell culture lots. Um, if you focus on the yield column again, the yields were ver very comparable and again high, close to 90% or above. Product quality again in terms of aggregate DNA and host cell protein levels was again very comparable between the pilot scale and small scale EPA runs as well as the MAP Select control. Again, the only difference we saw between the EBA and the MAP Select control was the difference in the protein A leachate levels which were higher for the EBA adsorbent versus the MAP Select control. As part of the scalability assessment, we also looked at the turbidity of the aluate pools coming off of the EBA runs. Um, and essentially, this was done to assess the impact on downstream filtration that this might have uh, when switching the conventional capture column uh, in a packed bed form to EBA. As you can see from the turbidity numbers reported here, uh, these were all very comparable to the turbidities measured for the MAP Select aluate pool, which tells us that there are no increased downstream filtration area requirements if we were to make the switch from packed bed chromatography to EBA. Next slide, please. To summarize the results of what I've shown in my talk today, uh, essentially we've clearly highlighted the benefits of EBA for map production by way of improved throughput and yield through the combination of the harvest and capture steps. So if you look at the table there, for traditional harvest followed by a protein A pack bed chromatography column, uh, we see typical yields of 80 to 90% for the harvest step and about 90 to 95% for the protein A column, which gives us an overall process yield of between 70 to 85% for these two steps combined. In contrast, for the EBA column, since we are directly processing salt-containing material, for the protein A column steps, the EBA protein A column step alone, we see yields between 85 to 95%, which translates into a yield enhancement of roughly 10 to 15 percent in the current example. Also, the product quality was shown to be comparable to that from the conventional process. Uh, once we have this data, that we clearly identified advantages to EPA and we moved on to perform a preliminary economic analysis to look at the costs for switching out from a current stainless steel pack bed and centrifuge facility into EBA mode. Uh, what really came out of this economic analysis is that for high tire processes in existing GMP facilities, the cost savings provided by EBA were not really that significant, and these were mainly offset by the changeover costs. So there's a significant amount of capital already invested in the centrifuge and a stainless steel equipment, and the changeover from that to EBA essentially nullifies any benefit of yield increases as well as cost reductions that might be achieved by EBA for existing GMP facilities. However, there's, there was a clear emerging application and a clear niche application that we identified here in terms of disposable manufacturing operations, and that's largely because current disposable harvest technologies have significant throughput limitations, and EBA has a clear opportunity here in terms of disposables manufacturing. Next slide, please. So in terms of path forward within Biogenetic, 
The following are the action items that we're really looking at in terms of implementing this technology within our manufacturing facilities. To begin with, we're really looking at the platformability of an EBA capture step. Uh, the particular case study that I showed you looks at only one particular monoclonal antibody, IgGA. But the idea here is to evaluate several different antibodies within biogenetics platform to see if the results are really comparable across the board. In addition, we'd also be interested in looking at the resin cleanability as well as column lifetime studies, which could have a significant bearing on the cost of goods analysis. And finally, we'd be looking to perform measurement of leachables and extractables for specifically for this absorbent, given that it has a tungsten carbide core, and we'd be interested in measuring what levels of leachate, if any, of the tungsten carbide we could expect to have in the protein A algorithm. So with that, I'd like to move to the next slide and wrap up my talk by acknowledging the different groups and people that have contributed to this work. Uh, specifically the analytical testing group, as well as the pilot scale groups at Biogenetic, as well as upfront chromatography for the constant support and guidance. Well, thank you very much for your time, and I'd like to hand the microphone back over to John. Uh, Steve, thank you very much for your discussion and your insights on second-generation expanded bed adsorption. I think you clearly illustrated the advantages of relying on ABA for monoclonal, monoclonal antibody production, so thank you for that presentation. Before we proceed, let me, let me remind everyone of our live Q&A segment that comes right after the panelists have made their presentations. Please type your questions into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console, and then hit Submit. Our third panelist, Richard Wright, is ready to explore MabDirect Protein A for the capture of antibodies from Joe Cultures. Richard, you can begin your presentation. Thank you, John. My name is Richard Wright. I work for Pfizer uh, at the Andover facility in Massachusetts, where we uh, develop uh, processes for therapeutic proteins. And today I'm going to talk to you about exploring MAB Direct Protein A and expanded bed adsorption resin for the capture of antibodies from CHO cultures. Next slide, please. This is an uh, outline of, of this brief talk that I'm, I'm going to go over uh, about this technology. We've already heard how expanded bed adsorption works and some of the potential advantages for that. And um, as many of us know, uh, there's a lot of therapeutic proteins made out of CHO cells, and many processes use protein A-related chromatography resins, and uh, protein A, EBA, is something that could be very useful for a lot of these processes. And so... We have been monitoring EBA protein A for quite a while, and I just want to give a brief history of, of some of the work that we've done around protein A, EBA, and uh, then focus on what we've done more recently, which is to examine the MAB direct protein A from uh, marketed by DSM and, and made by upfront. So we're going to just talk about how, generally how the performance of this resin is with multiple cycles of use, looking at the product quality, and some of our uh, observations concerning cycling and capacity loss. Next slide, please. So when we first started working with this, we worked with uh, the GE Streamline Protein A and the associated equipment. And that chromatography equipment included fritted chromatography columns that had screens in the bottom and the top that were large enough to allow cells to pass through but small enough that the uh, chromatography resin, the EBA resin, wouldn't flow out of the column. And generally, we had good cell clearance with this. We bound and eluded our uh, immunoglobulin proteins very well, and, and the quality was good. But the problem that we had regularly was that the fritz would clog, the top and bottom fritz would clog, and we couldn't clean them. So subsequent to that, uh, GE developed a, a better chromatography system that had open inlets at the bottom, no fritz at the bottom of the column. Um, and at the top, there was an optional frit that could be put in line when it was necessary, when there was a lot of turbulence. So we used that and also had pretty good binding and elution results, but we did have turbulence problems, particularly during the regeneration steps, when there would be low-density buffers, sometimes pushing out high-density buffers, causing a lot of turbulence that would cause the resin to swirl up and would require us putting the screen in the top in line to prevent from losing the resin. 
those screens gradually clogged once again. And so that was a problem, and we, we turned away from that. But more recently now, uh, we uh, have uh, looked at this, the DSM, or upfront MAB Direct Protein A, and in that situation, we have columns that have no fritz at all, and it has a denser resin that controls this turbulence, so we don't have as much problem with losing resin out of the top. So next slide, please. The great advantage of this MAV Direct Protein A is that uh, it has a denser bead. So if you look here down in the density, uh, the density is 2.8 to 3.2 grams per mil, which is considerably more dense than the GE Streamline Protein A resin was. Next slide, please. So in all of our work on the MAP Direct resin, we did all our work at laboratory scale, and, and this is, is a picture of the chromatography equipment that we use to do our experiments. On the left, you'll see here, either with one or two centimeter diameter columns, we had an open tube. This was set on top of a stir plate, and it had a magnetic stir bar in the bottom that, that spun around, and there was a tube at the top, so there was no fritz involved, and it was more or less an open column there. Uh, what we hope to get to eventually is, is the equipment on the right, which I think you've already seen pictures of, but that is uh, just a bigger version of the, of the small-scale column. It has an inlet rotating fluid distribution system, which, again, involves no fritz, and it also uh, has open tubes at the top for the process flow to go out. But anyway, uh, you should remember the stir bar in the bottom. That will come up later in the talk. Next slide, please. So in our evaluation of the, of the MAB Direct Protein A, we had two basic goals. One is just, is there good general uh, performance with consistent operation? Uh, did we overcome the turbulence issues we saw uh, with, the, with the previous Protein A resin? And secondly, is this resin and technology going to have robust operation where it consistently runs the same way, has easy cleaning and regeneration, and is it reusable for many, many cycles? Protein A resin is expensive, so it has to be reusable over a large number of cycles of use. Next slide, please. So uh, here, this just presents the general operating conditions that we use for our Protein A runs. It's really quite similar to most Protein A uh, chromatography conditions. The column uh, and the expanded resin is equilibrated in a wash buffer that is more or less isotonic to the load with it, that this contains the cells. Then the cell culture is pumped over up through the resin. Then it's washed uh, with a specific wash probably specifically designed for the product to wash impurities off of the column after your product is bound. Then there's a pre-elution wash to uh, lower the conductivity and prepare uh, the, the column for elution. We loot with a low pH buffer, and then after the product has come off, the column is stripped and, and regenerated. And in our experiments, we work with three different regeneration alternatives, one with sodium hydroxide, with uh, sodium sulfate, one with a combination of acids, and then also uh, a cleaning regime that had detergent and uh, EDTA around. The first two uh, regeneration solutions are kind of commonly used with protein A resin, something like this. And the latter is regeneration solution that was suggested for the uh, streamlined protein A's. Then all the columns were stored in an ethanol salt solution. Next slide, please. This is an example of one of the uh, one chromatogram from one of the runs we did. You can see, uh, it's, again, it's a pretty typical protein A uh, operation. Uh, the cells and media are pumped over the column. It's washed out. The uh, UV blue line is uh, washed to baseline. And after the wash, it's eluded. And then it's stripped and put into storage buffer. Next slide, please. In this slide, uh, you can see the uh, SDS page analytical results of the protein A pools from a number of sequential MAB direct protein A columns. And what you can see is, you know, a MAB select protein A resin is in, in lane two, and lanes uh, three through seven show all the uh, MAB direct protein A results, and they all look the same. So this expanded bed resin is performing the same as the protein A uh, in the packed bed. Next slide, please. 
This slide presents some other analytical results for the product pool off of uh, these various columns. And again, for host cell protein, for protein A, for percent high molecular weight, and percent acidic species, the results obtained with the MAB Direct Protein A are very similar to the packed bed equivalent. Next slide, please. In this slide, I present the results of the product protein of recovered off of each uh, chromatographic run with EBA over a series of, of runs, up to about uh, 12 to 15 runs. And what you see here is that uh, we started out with capacities, recovered protein, in the, say, the 30 to 35 mg per mil range. And with subsequent runs, we saw a decline in capacity. And uh, you can see, this is the cumulative days in storage. You can see what we would do is get a, a, a harvest of culture and sometimes we would just have one run or, or, or other times we would have multiple runs one day after another. And what you see is with each run, there is a decline in capacity and also just waiting going over time. You can always see a steady decline after the, the resin is, has uh, just sat in storage solution. The next time it's used, it, it, the capacity goes down. So this had us perplexed. And we saw this observation with both uh, a basic and an acidic uh, regeneration solution. So this caused us to speculate, you know, uh, about what might be the problem here. Could it be a protease? Could it be following? Next slide, please. Now, with a different culture and a different antibody and using the uh, EDTA and detergent regeneration, we didn't have this observation. You can see here that uh, the protein recovered is pretty steady going out to uh, at least six cycles. Next slide, please. So again, you know, we, in trying to understand what was going on with decreased capacity, we wondered if this was due to some kind of fouling, or that there was uh, something in the media that was uh, following the resin, so on subsequent runs uh, the product couldn't bind, or is this some kind of degradation or destruction of the resin? So we, we performed a number of experiments to try to understand that. Next slide, please. So one of the things we did was try to attempt to clear following with different solutions. So this is a list of the different solutions. We, we took some of the, the resin with reduced binding capacity, and we washed it extensively with all these different solutions, which included the, the acid and base solutions that we're already using for regeneration, the detergent solution with EDTA, then strong denaturants like guanidine and urea, reductants, and then something to break up DNA, if it was somehow DNA-mediated, we used DNAs. And after the treatment, we tested these for uh, a change in capacity. We saw no improvement in capacity, so nothing that was attempting to clean things off the resin seemed to improve it. Next slide, please. So another thing we looked at was whether just the, the media components uh, from the raw media could be uh, somehow following the resin. We tried our base media with the shear protectant uh, PVA, polyvinyl alcohol, and then also with polyvinyl alcohol and antifoam. And uh, we saw no significant improvement or change in, in recovery after a significant exposure of the resin to that. That's, that was unused resin. Next slide, please. So an, another thing we looked at was could we see any evidence for following a cross-linking of resin? So here, on the right, you see a microscopic image of the resin beads. This is one of the resins that we used in the study, and it didn't look like there was a lot of cross-linking of matter between the beads. I don't have a picture of it here, but uh, we did see in some cases that some of the resin was significantly degraded, significantly uh, chopped up into very fine pieces. And I mentioned earlier that there was a stir bar in the uh, bottom of the small uh, one to two centimeter diameter column. And that we learned as we went on is sometimes can be a problem, can sometimes generate fines. And we, partway through our experiments, we stopped using the stir bar because we were feared that we, we were generating fines. So we did see some evidence for that. That may account for this. Another thing we looked at just, just to see if there was chemical degradation of the storage solutions, either the acid uh, or the regeneration solutions. So next slide, please. In this graph, we have the sodium hydroxide and the phosphoric acid treated naive resin, and we just observed capacities after uh, periods of exposure that 
would encompass the time that we had used the resin on the multiple cycles of use. So the, the total exposure to the regeneration solutions was about the same. And what you see here is that just the regeneration solutions alone did not cause uh, a significant decline in the resin capacity. So to sum up then, we have used the uh, MAP Direct EBA resins over multiple runs with cultures that have been held up to even four days consecutively at room temperature and saw consistently good performance in terms of the quality of the product. We saw ranges of capacity between 20 to 35 mg per mil with uh, what were IgG1 molecules. We lost capacity with the MAB1 culture that I showed you using two different regeneration solutions. Didn't seem to be associated with media components. Didn't seem to be associated with the caustic or acidic regen solutions that we used. Uh, it seemed to be correlating to time and to runs with specific cultures. Um, and there's a possibility that that might have been mediated by uh, mechanical destructions of the bead. And I would want to mention that for another antibody with a different regeneration solution, we did not see any decline in capacity. So going forward, we want to return to this and uh, go back and look at this, being sure not to use a stir bar in our resin and uh, go back and see if we can either by not using the stir bar or by perhaps using the sarcosine and EDTA regeneration solution, if we can uh, maintain that constant capacity. And if we do, then, then this should be a pretty promising resin for us to use. Next slide, please. I'd just like to acknowledge uh, these people who contributed to uh, this presentation. Thank you. Back to you, John. Well, thank you, Richard, for talking about the history of Cho harvesting at Pfizer and very clearly illustrating the use of the impact of different resins. And your discussion about the direct capture of bioproducts directly leads to our next speaker. But before giving him the go-ahead, let me remind the audience of our upcoming Q&A segment, which will take place right after the next speaker completes his presentation. Again, please type your questions into the Ask a Question box on the lower left of your console and then hit Submit. Our final speaker is Ralph Dewenga. He will provide additional examples and data on direct product capture via robust expanded bed absorption. Ralph, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Um, so after the previous presentations, I would like to show the results that, uh, that we have had as, as DSM. Uh, by applying the robust expanded bed absorption technology with XD uh, at very high cell density choke processes. Next slide. In the outline of my presentation is after a small introduction, uh, the future of protein manufacturing as we see it. Then uh, I'd like to explain a bit about the XD process technology because it has a big impact on how you would operate uh, the robust technology and then the uh, results that we achieved by combining the robust and the XD. Next slide, please. The future of protein manufacturing. If you look at today's manufacturing, everybody's using large stainless steel bioreactors. These pea bottlenecks are now created because of high tidal processes. Plants have a very large footprint and very high capex. And you see a picture of a 20,000 liter stainless steel bioreactor here. On the right side of the slide, you see the future uh, of protein manufacturing as we see it. So moving into disposable systems, efficient processes, small footprint, low capex, fast, flexible, and still meeting product quality demands. Next slide. Now what is XD? XD uh, is a very high density cell culture. It's a DSM proprietary process technology and it boosts titer and bioreactor productivity by a factor of 5 to 10. It boosts cell density for a, by a factor of 5 to 10. And this is very important because this is what we're going to feed into the expanded bed absorption columns. Uh, we maintain very high cell viability, so about 90%. We get good controllable product quality. It's cell independent, so you can run with Joe, with Hybridoma, with Percy 6. You have a standard batch time, around 14 days or 20 days with Percy 6. You have a single concentrated batch of products, and you can uh, adjusted to existing processes. Next slide, please. On this slide, you see the very high cell densities that we achieve. So typically in fed batch, you get 
10 to 20 million cells per milliliter. So that's also what the previous speakers uh, have been using with the expanded bed absorption. Uh, with XD, we are going to 130 million cells or higher, and we are able to feed that directly on the robust column. Next slide, please. Now, why are we running XD? We're running it to boost the titer. So because of very high cell densities, we can uh, boost it by a factor of 5 to 10. So you see here on the orange uh, line a fat patch titer for an FC fusion protein of 1.2 gram per liter. Um, and with XD, uh, we are getting 11 gram per liter. Next slide, please. Here you see the, uh, the cell densities and the viabilities of XD Cho versus fat batch. Uh, the orange lines are the fat batch curves. Where on the bottom you see the cell viability, which is yeah, norm, in a normal range of fat beds, so around 10 million cells per milliliter, and the viability that uh, after day eight drops to around 60 percent. The green curve is the uh, are the curves for XD. So you see there that the cell density grows to 150 million cells, uh, and you, you see the viability staying very high above 90 percent. Next slide, please. The, very recently, we gave out a press release where we reported a record uh, viable cell density of 242 million cells per milliliter at day 15, and with a titer of an FC fusion protein of 11.5 gram per liter. Next slide, please. And that is what we have fed on robust. Not at the highest level, not the 242. But uh, we did run it at uh, 150 million cells per milliliter. And that's what you see uh, on these pictures. So in the flask, you see the, the XD harvest. Uh, and then on the picture in, on the top, you see the equilibration. Then the second picture, you see the first cell breakthrough. Uh, on the third picture, the complete cell breakthrough. Uh, so we're feeding the cone from the bottom. And so the cell mass is trickling through the column without any problem. And after we have captured the protein, we wash out the cells. That's what you see in the fourth uh, picture. Uh, and after uh, completion of wash, you see that we have a very clear liquid. Uh, and then we start diluting, and then you end up with a post-protein A intermediate uh, in a very clear solution. Next slide, please. In this uh, picture, you see the OD280 curve. Uh, of the run, uh, and uh, on the right you see in the different colors different steps that, that we are running on the on the column. So equilibration, loading, wash one, wash two, elution, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you see it also here in the curve. So uh, at uh, at the volume of uh, just about 30 liter, you see the OD280 increasing uh, because of the, the cell mass and the media going through. Then at just before 50 liter, uh, we start the first wash, uh, and then you see the, the, the curve going down. Second wash is the green one, the second green one at around 70 liter, and then at around 90, uh, you see the production peak coming off. On the next slide, you see the comparison of the 10 centimeter run with the 2 centimeter run, and compare that to a packed bed run, and pack bed run is, is number C. Uh, a difference that, that you see is uh, mainly on the uh, on the first peak. You see that uh, in picture A that there's quite a tail in the first peak, and that that is a tail that you typically don't see uh, in a pack bed column, which is logic. You have to, of course, wash off the cell mass and the other media rest, etc., uh, and that is uh, in a normal operation already uh, gotten rid of in the centrifugation or filtration phase. The other two peaks are comparable. So if you look at the product peak and the, the wash peaks, uh, they're in the same range. Actually, the wash peak is a bit higher because uh, we, we do see that some of the, the debris uh, is stuck to the beads, and that's also something that you wash off. Next slide, please. In this picture, you see the, uh, the overall result. Uh, so where we're comparing um, fat batch clarification, protein A, and pack batch, so really the classical operation, uh, and we are comparing it with XD, protein
protein A, so where the XD is directly fed onto the column. And then you see that the yield in, uh, in the classical operation is around 85%, and with XD and protein A, uh, we get a yield above 90%. Typical range is between 90 and, and 95%. Uh, and so this higher yield is, is mainly because we're skipping the uh, two unit operations, so no, no filtrations or no centrifugation. Purity is the same, so uh, the purity is above 95%, um, and that is caused by the protein A. So the, the protein A is comparable in both systems, so the classical and the uh, expanded bed mode. Also, proteins are in, in the comparable range, uh, so for fat batch uh, 1 to 15, uh, microgram per milligram map, uh, and what we saw with XD and EBA, uh, between 0.3 and 23, and that's uh, a range of 19 experiments. DNA, same thing, so comparable range um, in normal classical operation 23 to 49, and with XD and E by 3.7 to 121. The residual protein A is also in the same range, so the resin performance there is, is also comparable. Next slide. Yeah, so the question is uh, then, of course, if you look at the, um, the features of, of Robust, when DSM acquired the technology, uh, there were a number of promises. And what we needed to do is check whether these promises are coming through with HD. Uh, so the, the first feature to allow free passage of particulate material and direct capture without prior cell removal. And what we've seen with the 150 million cells per milliliter, uh, you can go pump it straight through the column uh, it does reduce your clarification and capture from three to one step, so we really do, do not need to filter, uh, do not need to send fuge. Um, and because of that, uh, we, we do get less processing time uh, and a higher recovery yield. The, uh, uh, what I've not presented in the previous slide, but it is something that, uh, that, that uh, we have seen with other results, uh, there's a large ligand library for uh, protein A, but also for mixed mode ligands, and we've tested them in, uh, with different proteins, and uh, also there we got very good performance. Uh, so that means that uh, you can adjust your ligands to the protein requirements. There is no back pressure from the adsorbent bed, so the column is, uh, is not a high pressure column, and we are just pumping the uh, material uh, through the column there's no flow rate limitation related to back pressure, uh, and as I said, the column is not pressurized. Uh, another very nice feature is that you don't need packing. So when we set up the, the pilot unit, it took us a day to set it up. So we installed the, the column and the, the bioprocess unit, uh, and then the resin material is just poured or, uh, or pumped in. So a very fast and very easy setup. The another feature of the technology is uh, that the robust columns accommodate air bubbles and precipitated material. We see that. So air bubbles are just trickling through the column, uh, so there's no impact on bed stability. Also small uh, particles, they just go through, and you've seen that on the picture, what happens with the cell material. So it is a separation technology with a very little downtime, so you don't have to worry that uh, something is happening with the column. Uh, because of a disturbance. Next slide, please. Yeah, so overall, for us, the promise really uh, came true. So it's a, a great technology with XD's uh, very high cell densities, and um, comparable results are also achieved with other customers, so with other high-density harvests, so microbial and transgenic plants. And this is the last thing I wanted to uh, say, so thank you, John. Well, thank you, Rolf, and thanks to the other panelists for their timely presentations. As I said at the beginning of the webinar, our purpose was to describe a novel approach for improving bioprocess economics. I think our panelists have accomplished this goal superbly, so thanks to all of them. We've received some very interesting questions from the audience during the webinar, so we will start off with the first question for Alan, and it's very interesting, Alan, we have a number of uh, I think combined questions today, so that's what I'm going to ask them to you. So it's a two-part question. Please describe any channeling effects 
if they can occur and how they can be managed? And how do you start to rotate the device with the resin in the column? Is the resin allowed to settle? The basic purpose of the inlet design is to achieve an even liquid distribution across the entire cross-section of the column, and thereby avoiding channeling and uneven flow patterns inside the column. It is really of uh, high importance to have plug flow uh, through the column. So even though the the inlet distribution device does give some turbulence at the very bottom of the column. It uh, distributes liquid uh, very efficiently and at a certain distance above the bottom, about five uh, centimeters above the bottom, the, the, uh, the bed becomes uh, stabilized and you have plug flow from there and upwards, giving you a very efficient absorption. And thereby, you also uh, avoid the channeling effects that uh, are questioned. The, uh, the rotating uh, device is uh, started when uh, the bed has been expanded. So when you start up your column, you will start putting on uh, a flow for a few minutes to ensure that the bed is expanded to a certain degree, and then you start the rotating motion of the device. There was also questions relating to whether the resin breakage would be an issue with these distribution devices. And uh, uh, there was referred to that the lab scale columns using a stir bar uh, might uh, uh, crush some beads. That is correct, that may happen in certain situations. But when scaling up, the system changes into not using stir bars, but using this rotating uh, uh, device that we have been discussing. And during those circumstances, there will be no resin breakage at all. Okay, and I think we have another question related to that, Alan. So if you want to continue some more about uh, person asked, stir bars can generate fines, which may be a factor from small scale operations. Uh, how would this impact larger scale with stir bar and the apparatus? And tied to that, are there concerns with having a rotating bed distribution arm and the creation of resin fines? Yeah. Uh, as mentioned, when we, uh, when we scale up uh, from the lab scale columns, which are one or two centimeter in diameter, the stir bar system is substituted with a rotating uh, reverse garden sprinkler, as I described in my presentation. So above the very small scale, there is no stir bar inside the column, and therefore there is no breakage of, of resin particles for that reason. Okay, Alan, and again a combined question. What is the particle size of expanded bed absorbance? And the, the questioner asks, I thought optimal chromatography involved usage of a resin with near same size particles. Perhaps you can expand on the advantages with respect to convection of the formation of a particle size gradient with the upfront resin. Yes, uh, it is uh, correct that uh, the standard expectation in the pack bed uh, classical uh, column that you would like to see a very narrow particle size distribution in order to separate very closely related uh, components. In the EBA column, the situation is quite different. Uh, first of all, you are looking at a capture uh, of a group of proteins, a protein or a group of proteins, capture and release. So the need for a narrow particle uh, distribution is not expressed in this system. Uh, con in contrast, it is actually important to have a certain level of um, uh, spread of the particle sizes. So typically you would like to see a factor of three uh, between the smallest particles and the larger particles. And this is, this is to achieve an efficient stratification of the particles inside the EBA column. And this stratification is the most important factor, giving you a stable expanded bed uh, without back mixing. Alan, thank you very much. Asif, we have a some questions for you. And the first one is, you mentioned partial purification only. 
what do you have to do for higher purification in a process? I believe that question is related to uh, one of my early slides in the talk where I talked about potential advantages of EBA. And really, um, I was referring more to the protein A EBA where you'd expect to mainly separate the product from pro uh, processed layer impurities such as host cell proteins and host cell DNA. Um, product related impurities such as aggregate and clips are often not separated uh, uh, at all or very well on protein A. So really, I, I guess that comment comes from uh, the scope of the work that uh, we performed at Biogenetic. And another question I see if it's uh Looks like a statement, but I think it's meant to be a question. It seems that HCP from EBA is three times higher. I guess it's a question. He's questioning that. Um, actually, if going back to my slides, unfortunately I can't pick, pull those up right now, but the data showed that they were actually very comparable within um, the limits of assay variability when you look at the EBA, the HCP levels in the EBA alloyed versus the MAP select control alloyed. So to throw out some numbers from some of the slides that I showed earlier, uh, we had ATP levels of roughly 978 ppm for the EBA run compared to about 1,030 ppm for a corresponding MAP select control run. Um, and that's kind of the theme for all the data that I showed. So it's not really 3x higher. It's comparable within limits of um, experimental variability. Okay, and another question, Asif. Uh, how do you store the EBA system? It looks open and less sanitary than some other fritted designs. Sure. So in that in that sense, and um, Alan and Rolf, uh, please feel free to chime in if you have anything to add. But really, the way we, we store it, it's not really very different from our traditional um, protein A column storage. Of course, we'd use the appropriate storage solutions uh, that have the bactericidal and viricidal properties. Um, you pretty much shut the column at the bottom and the top, uh, collection tubes or uh, inlets and outlets. Um, and if there there may be an air vent in the column design, at least the pilot scale column that we were using had an air vent there, uh, which had um, a sterile filter coupled to that to prevent any, um, uh, to basically keep the system closed and sterile. And I see if we have another combined question. Part A is, can you shed some light on how the cell debris is removed from the chromatography media? And the second part is, can you provide details of how the cells are washed out of the EBA column? Sure. So I guess those, both those questions kind of asking the same thing. Um, and really, for, this, for the purpose of this application, uh, the most important um, assessment that needs to be performed is that we do not have any cell adsorbent binding going on uh, because if that were to occur that kind of uh, uh, prevents the application of EBA for that for that particular product so when we started working with this with this adsorbent that was one of the things we looked at first right up front is to evaluate cell adsorbent binding uh, and to ensure that that was not happening um, and, w and once we confirmed that that was okay. Then it was pretty trivial, pretty straightforward, where we put the load over the column and then have one or more wash steps, appropriate wash solutions after that, uh, which would essentially just wash the cell debris out of the column. Thank you very much. Okay. And, and, is any, okay. and Ralph, we have some questions for you. Uh, is the protein A resin for EBA proprietary of Upfront or DSM? Who is the supplier of columns for EBA? Yeah, let me let me, uh, let me explain. So, um, the Upfront uh, has developed the technology, and and we have acquired it from Upfront last year. Uh, so that means that uh, anyone who is now interested in it uh, has to approach us. We're still working very closely together with Upfront, so so we're ensuring that no, no nothing of the know-how is gone. Uh, but uh, but we are the first contact for that. Okay, Ralph, and another question. Has there been any work done using bacterial cell lysates? Are there any concerns with resin fouling with smaller particles? Yeah, so um, actually uh, in, in this presentation or, or these presentations, we focused on uh, mammalian cell culture, but uh, the technology is also used in microbial, so uh, E. coli lysates, uh, yeasts, um, and uh, for, for these lysates, the, we need to optimize, so then we're always talking about mixed-mode uh, resin, so not protein A resin. 
uh, and uh, also there the, uh, the results are very promising. And picking up on your response, another question, where might one obtain more information on XD technology from mammalian cell propagation? Yeah, so we can uh, uh, also there, uh, you can approach the ESM for that, and then uh, we can explain how it works and what can be done with it. And, Ralph, another question, do the dilution and elution buffers typically require optimization for the EBA system? Are there a few stock GMP-made buffers uh, this person should ask his firm to assist uh, in doing this work. Well, what we see is that, uh, that uh, in principle, the buffers are comparable to what you would typically use for packed bed uh, protein A columns. Um, what's important is that uh, uh, for the first uh, washing of the resin, uh, we're using a buffered saline solution, uh, but for the rest, everything is comparable. Thank you, Ralph. And unfortunately, we've run out of time, but please note that this webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genegnews.com. If you missed parts of it, you can watch it again, or you can recommend it to your colleagues and friends. I want to say thanks again to the panel for the outstanding presentations. I also want to say thank you to our audience for your attention and for your thoughtful questions, as just displayed in the responses, about various topics brought up during the webinar. And thank you to our sponsor, DSM, who made this event possible. Shortly, we'll be sending you a survey, and we would appreciate your feedback on this webinar. Please look out for it and kindly give us your thoughts, as this will help us to continue to bring you topical and timely webinars in the future. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.